Guru Shri Uttapada Kamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Shcha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahaganath Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Dvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Jaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitam Shcha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesha Sunyavari Pasyatya De Satarine Pancha Kalpa Tarupischa Kripa Sindhu Paebacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Siddhi Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Sri Makti Bhakti Tirtha Swami, Itinamine. So, yeah, Tushar instructed me that uh, we would also include the 26 qualities of a devotee in relationship to Bhakti Tirtha Swami's life. So I thought we'll start off by reading those 26 qualities which are mentioned at least in four different purports in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Although not very much explanation is given in relationship to them, they're pretty much self-explanatory. And this is uh, Krishna Das Kaviraj's list of following 26 good qualities of a Vaishnava, which are standard and accepted by everyone. And I'll read them. One, very kind to everyone. Two, does not make anyone their enemy. Truthful, equal to all. No one can find fault in that person. Magnanimous, mild, clean without possessions, works for the benefit of others, very peaceful, always surrendered to Krishna, has no material desires, very meek, steady, controls the senses, does not eat more than required, not influenced by the Lord's illusory energy, offers respects to everyone, does not have any desire for respect for oneself, very grave, merciful, friendly, poetic, expert, and silent. Mm -hmm. The Bhakti Tirtha Swami exu you know, exhibited many of these qualities at different times, and his life is a very, what we say, what we say, exciting adventure in Krishna consciousness because one of his qualities, he was always looking to open new fronts in how to spread Krishna consciousness around the world. Um, he was an innovator. He was one who could see see the future. In other words, he was very foresighted in seeing how to spread Srila Prabhupada's mission, not only within the devotee area, but into all sectors of society. His uh, focus in doing that was to learn about some of these other areas of society and then uh, be able to present Krishna consciousness accordingly. <laughs> he could speak to generals at the Pentagon, which he did. He was actually holding classes uh, for leading people who were in the military, in the Pentagon. He had friends with many politicians, senators, and others. Entertainers, even made some entertainers devotees, um, people in general. But I would say out of all his outstanding qualities, and many, was his concern for the devotees and how they were getting what they needed in order to practice Krishna consciousness. As a person growing up in a very impoverished and a very deprived atmosphere, he lived in the ghettos of Cleveland, Ohio, and had very little. His mother would always instruct him, whatever you have, give to others. And so he was very uh, 
generous, whatever little possessions he had, he never had that much. But his mother, he would always give credit to his mother. She taught him that if you have two of something, give one away. <laughs> so he was uh, uh, in that atmosphere, deprived, but at the same time always thinking about how to help others. <laughs> He struggled throughout his life during the times when there was a lot of racism, racism quite overtly in America. But then that same racism went covert, but it was still there even in a more difficult way because now it wasn't so easy to see, although it was there. Um, even when he went to college, somehow or other he excelled in his studies in school and was given a special grant to go to um, one of the Ivy League schools, Princeton University, uh, which is a very top university in the United States. But he describes from being there, he was always very much discriminated against because he was one of the few people who were of the black skin there. And so uh, struggling all through his life because of being if the race he was, but still never becoming discouraged in his uh, desire to help people. He joined a Martin Luther King's March when he was a young man and he worked in, uh, in, in assisting people who were uh, imprisoned. And he was a, like a deputy to one, I think, attorney general who was so he had many positions in society, all with the idea to raise society up, help the underprivileged. And when he came to Krishna consciousness, which is an interesting story, how he came to Krishna consciousness, and um, when he came, took to Krishna consciousness, he understood this is what he was actually looking for all his life. Now he could understand that you could only help people really on the spiritual level. Although he tried so much in the material level, and this is also one of his outstanding qualities, he could understand that uh, whatever you do on a material level is usually lost in time or whatever is gained. Sometimes we find that people don't appreciate that. But on the spiritual level, when someone becomes advanced spiritually or makes advancement spiritually, that's something they can grow and they develop the, go, the qualities they need to develop in order to live life in a very progressive and very satisfying way where they can use their creativity to uh, you know, practice spiritual life and also expand the mission of Srila Prabhupada. So he was a, uh, a person with great foresight. When he was in the early days of his Krishna consciousness movement, he joined a thing called the Library Party, started by Satsarup Maharaj. And he was one of the members of the Library Party, along with a few others. And their service was to take whatever Prabhupada had translated in forms of his books to different university professors and convince the professors to put them in their libraries or use them for their textbooks in presenting their colleges. And so uh, he traveled all around America doing that. And finally, he also went uh, into Europe. And during the uh, communist regime you know, throughout Europe, where many of the countries had turned communist, he was working behind the Iron Curtain to bring Prabhupada's books to universities that were in the Eastern Bloc or those that were behind the Iron Curtain. So literally he risked his life in order to uh, spread Krishna consciousness. But it wasn't so much like what we think it was. It was more his own compassion for wanting to help others. He saw that this was the way to do it by giving Krishna consciousness to others. On the day-to-day -day level, when I used to have much association with him, and I found during that time, you know, he would spend a lot of time with devotees and others dealing with their personal problems. Um, he was always concerned that devotees were happy, 
got what they needed to practice Krishna consciousness and were free from, uh, you know, the anxieties that come with the struggle of becoming a devotee. Uh, you might say he was there for the little guy. <laughs> he was always interested in helping those who were, what we say, marginalized. And in those days in Krishna consciousness, in the early days, there were, there were groups that were marginalized. We can read about them in the history, and that was the youth of our movement were somewhat abused in many of the schools. And women were somewhat, what we say, sidelined and seen as second class in many, many of our temples and throughout our movement. And so he didn't like that. He never thought that was Krishna consciousness, and he worked against that and became, what we say, a person that people could come to and get advice, get direction, and get what we say, uh, the, ins the inspiration they needed in order to carry on in their Krishna consciousness. So that was Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj. Um, that was his main quality. He also wanted to establish communities, which was a big thing in his uh, preaching. He saw the importance of having devotee communities, and that way devotees could work together, use resources, could pool resources together, pool intelligence together, pool labor together. And this was also, of course, Srila Prabhupada's vision for our society. Uh, he wanted to establish many of the rural communities, farm communities, and invite devotees to come and live in that environment and take care of animals, cows, especially grow crops, and live a more simplified lifestyle, and uh, practice Krishna consciousness somewhat free from the, the, uh, the hectic, uh, what we say, uh, struggle that goes on in, the, in urban life. So uh, Maharaj was very big on that. He spoke a lot about communities. He gave seminars on communities. He talked about the responsibility of each and every devotee, how to, how to live in a community, and how to appreciate each other. And this was one of his uh, strongest points, that each and every devotee is important. Each and every devotee has something to offer. Each and every devotee should have everything they need to live nicely in Krishna consciousness and and to uh, make progress back home, back to Godhead. I had personal experience when, um, in I think the year was 1997, I think that was the year, it was right around that time, he moved into Gita Nagri. Um, before then, he was in Washington, D.C. He ha had started the an uh, uh, organization called IFAST, the, um, let me see, uh, IFAST is, uh, let me see if I can remember the, the Applied Spiritual Technology, Institute for Applied Spiritual Technology, that was IFAST, and he had attracted a lot of people who had great talents, who had great abilities, who had uh, learned many, 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 what we say, alternate forms of uh, like homeopathic medicine and Ayurveda, uh, martial arts, uh, people who could do various types of what we say, uh, coronary activities, which would, you know, inspire devotees in their Krishna consciousness. So he built a quite a large following in that area. But then uh, when uh, Gita Nagari was going through a very difficult time, somehow Tamal Krishna, Tamal Krishna Goswami contacted Bhakti Tirtha Swami and said, uh, I think you should go there and try to help that community. He thought about it, saw what he was doing, and he decided to move his whole operation from Washington, D.C., a very urban type of program, to Gita Nagari. At that time, I was very close friends with him, and I was spending much time with him, so I also came along to see how I could be an assistant in the whole project. 
And I remember um, he would have hold seminars with all his devotees who were working under him in the city. And now they were all asked to kind of like transfer their whole lifestyle to a more rural thing. Now, for some people, that was quite hard. There were people at that time who were making quite a lot of money in their own jobs in the cities, and they were asked to give that up, put on the overalls, get a get a little dirty, uh, start learning how to, you know, develop agriculture, you know, take care of animals. And just to see if we can re uh, what we say revitalize the community. The community had gone down to such a low level where there was only about three or four devotees who were really keeping the whole place together, and where there was about a sixty there was sixty to a hundred devotees living all around the community, who in some way was connected to the community but were not had not become active for a long time. So Maharaj went in there and inspired his own devotees to somehow or other get involved in many of the services. And between myself and him, we were trying to, we were trying to inspire those devotees on the outskirts who had no longer participated to somehow come back in. And that wasn't easy. And so a lot of that fell short of what we actually expected. But Maharaj was never discouraged. He used his devotees to fill in all the needed services. And gradually the community started to build and build and build. And then of course, actually even today, now Gita Nagari is, you know, um, one of the more uh, successful rural communities in, in North America. And it was all due to his inspiration. And he taught a lot about interpersonal relationships, how devotees should act in relationship to other devotees, how devotees should care for other devotees. And uh, he also, in teaching the uh, devotees how to live on the farm, of course, he was also living in that same way. He would also go out and do agriculture with the devotees in the fields. He would always walk his talk, as they say in, uh, you know, in ordinary vernacular. He, whatever he was telling people to do, he did it himself. And he did it in an exemplary way. In Krishna consciousness, it's understood that, you know, Example is higher than precept. We can speak something, and we should, and that is required, and what we say important. But at the same time, one who lives according to whatever they speak, their words have much more effect. And so he was living everything that he was teaching to the devotees. And he was also learning how to live on the farm himself at the same time. And so we were gradually seeing how that community was starting to build. And um, unfortunately, a lot of the people on the outside drifted away because they wanted a different kind of lifestyle. They didn't want to get involved. They wanted to live on the outskirts and not really be part of the community anymore. And so he had to deal with that and very few not very few, but uh, a smaller group from the outside actually rejoined and actually came back in. So he did mostly everything with his own devotees to, in order to, in, to set up an infrastructure in that community, which was a very viable. And then he was giving very much classes morning and evening, seminars during the day working really hard to inspire devotees and get them involved in Krishna consciousness. Um, and he was always, you know, at the same time, he had some connection with the outside world, so he would also have to leave and travel around. Uh, I'm sitting here in, in Zagreb, Croatia, in the temple now, and uh, at least 25 devotees in this, this country are his disciples. He was the GBC here for many years, 
and he also traveled to other places around the world and did work to preach. So not only was he very much uh, focused on developing communities, he was also inspiring people around the world by traveling and preaching. His life is the most interesting. We have one book about his life, which is entitled Black Lotus, but I think that book is just an introduction to his life. There's much more that could be said about his life and what he taught and the dynamicism of his Krishna consciousness. He was very dynamic. Uh, when he set his mind to do something, he was fixed in that. Nothing could deviate him. And he was so, uh, what we say, uh, what we say determined to carry it out. Particularly when he was working with the, the library party around the world, how he inspired people to take books how he uh, risked his life behind the Iron Curtain to meet professors in countries like East Germany. Uh, at the time, it was also communist Czechoslovakia. Uh, and there was also communist Hungary. And so many of the countries that are now not communist were under that communist uh, regime. And he was very much active behind the scenes uh, distributing Prabhupada's books. And one of the amazing things is that he would be easily noticed because of his, uh, because of his, uh, what we say, his racial traits. And therefore, it didn't discourage him at all. And many times he had to run for his life in order to get away from the various types of, you know, mil military and local police who were looking for him. So um, here's a man who gave everything to Krishna consciousness. In uh, the year 1977, Srila Prabhupada was feeling quite ill and he was uh, slowing down in his travels. He went to Vrindavan and then Prabhupada in, was in Vrindavan in September of 1977 he decided to make another effort to uh, preach Krishna consciousness, although his health was not so good. He got really inspired and he wanted, he said, 50% of my mission has not been established. I want to establish these farm communities. I want to go to Gita Nagari right away and establish these farm communities. And so Prabhupada left Vrindavan and he went to London and he stayed there for a while. While he was in London, Bhakti Tirta Swami had come back from preaching behind the Iron Curtain. And Tamal Krishna Goswami, who was very close to Srila Prabhupada, saw when Bhakti Tirta Swami came. His name was Ganesham Pri at the time. He said to Prabhupada, he said, your Ganesham has come. When Prabhupada heard that, because Prabhupada had been getting letters, uh, hearing about how he was selling books behind the Iron Curtain. And Prabhupada said, anyone who sells, who sells my books in communist countries, I take the dust of their lotus feet on my head. That's how Prabhupada felt about his book distribution in places around the world. He said that about Arab countries. He said that about communist countries. And so, Tamal Krishna Goswami decided to bring Bhakti Tirta Swami to see uh, Srila Prabhupada, when he walked in the room, Prabhupada got up from his seat, walked all the way over to him and embraced him, was rubbing his head like his own child, and he said, your life is successful. So he got the special, special, special mercy of Srila Prabhupada by, because he had risked his life to, to bring Krishna consciousness around the world. In my own uh, interaction with him, he was always willing to do whatever it could, he could, to reach people with this message of Krishna consciousness. He traveled around America. He was on radio shows. He was on TV shows. He had many interviews with different reporters. He met important personalities. Um, 
all with the idea of, of bringing Krishna consciousness into the mainstream. He had many, many outstanding qualities. Um, his quality of compassion was always there in everything he said. You could see or you could feel when he was speaking that he was speaking from his heart and not just from just from words that were memorized. He was he actually embraced Krishna consciousness perfectly in everything he did. And uh, the results are, of course, many, many, many uh, wonderful devotees came out from that. Maharaj, when Maharaj went to Russia, he stayed there for almost a month and he performed many, many uh, programs on the outside, so much so that one Russian devotee actually wrote a biography of his life in Russian. And so that was the second biography that was done. Of course, that was done before the first biography, but later it wasn't translated. I don't think until recently, I'm not sure exactly when it was translated. So uh, how much he, he entered into the lives of each and every person he met. <laughs> so uh, there are many, many stories about his life, about how, how he risked everything to preach Krishna consciousness. Um, how he helped the young people in in uh, our society when they were struggling with, uh, you know, being uh, abused, and the effects of the abuse afterwards. When many of them were growing older and they had still had that that uh, scar of the early days of growing up in Krishna consciousness, how he was able to somehow make them feel wanted, how how important they were. And uh, it's, there even, um, there, even uh, there was one incident where 10 of them went to see Bhakti Tirtha Swami. This was just during the time when he had his illness. They came to see them. Him, when they all came out, they were all crying. They were crying in tears of joy because they, they all said, that man is so close to God. They had an, uh, they had an amazing experience just being with him. And that was my experience too. And I, everybody who was who had an experience with him, always came away feeling there was something special about being with him. We either learned something, or we had an, a nice ex experience just being in his presence. Um, he was in his early days. Of course, he was super austere. I mean, so austere that it would cause everybody to, what we say, uh, uh, shake in horror <laughs> how austere he was. <laughs> he would, uh, when he was traveling around in the early days doing uh, the, the library party and even before then, he was chanting 42 rounds a day, eating once a day, and, and all he would eat was a cup of yogurt and a carrot and a tomato. That was practically all he ate the whole day. <laughs> and he would just be serving so much. In fact, he, be, he was so austere that the devotees that were working with him got a little nervous because <laughs> they couldn't keep up with him. He would be up at 1 o'clock in the morning every day chanting rounds and getting ready for the day's activities. So Maharaj was a powerhouse of spiritual energy and a powerhouse of compassion. And of course, he loved Krishna consciousness so much. Um, when he first joined, when he saw the devotees chanting and dancing in Kirtan, and he thought, this is a little strange. We should be more serious. But later on, he became one of the best and most enthusiastic dancers in our movement. <laughs> so everything changed. By the mercy of uh, by the mercy of Prashila Prabhupada, he just embraced everything about Krishna consciousness. Um, he would only eat once a day because it mentions in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam that um, 
in all, one should practice Krishna consciousness in the best possible way is one should eat only once a day. It's in the seventh canto. It also says it's very good for health. So he would only eat once a day, he would eat no breakfast, and he would eat lunch. In the evening, sometimes someone would give him a glass of juice, or sometimes he would not even eat anything. So many times he would be fasting for 24 hours. I mean, he really pushed himself just to practice Krishna consciousness. So uh, there are many, many wonderful stories, of course. <laughs> and uh, his life and uh, these 26 qualities he imbibed all 26 of them uh, many he wrote many books of course many of the books were transcriptions of his lectures but also in in, in one series he wrote was the uh, spiritual warrior series he wrote six books on those um, I remember when I was in uh, London. Well, I was I was going to the temple in Soho Street, and I was staying at the Bhaktivedanta Manor, and I would be traveling to Soho to give classes and travel back. So one day when I was traveling back after giving a class in Bhagavatam in the morning, I was speaking to the driver, and one driver was saying, you know, there was one young man who was coming to the temple, but he couldn't make it. And after some time, after trying to make it in Krishna consciousness, he stopped coming. But then someone gave him a copy of Bhakti Tirtha Swami's book, uh, Spiritual Warrior Two. When he read the book, he was convinced that this is it, and he came back to the temple and started practicing again. <laughs> so these are some of the amazing stories and how he touched people's lives. Um, there are so many interesting incidents of course when he was in africa he opened up africa Srila Prabhupada personally came to him in a dream and told him to go to africa and begin preaching there after he had that dream not long after that he was on his way to africa and he was preaching in countries like ivory coast and nigeria and ghana and other places he made many, many devotees there who are still his disciples. Um, he came in contact with Nelson Mandela and became good friends with Nelson Mandela. And they shared a microphone in one great, great uh, festival in South Africa one time when they were speaking about uh, the value of understanding and appreciating each other no matter what color or what race what background what economic uh, background you may have and it doesn't really matter going beyond all the sectarian things that divide society based on material considerations and going into the heart of our relationship with each other based on the principle that every living entity is a spirit, soul, part and parcel of Krishna. <laughs> and Bhakti Tirtha Swami was speaking in one lecture in South Africa, how in our Krishna consciousness movement, we are the real, what we say, United Nations. What the United Nations have tried to do by bringing nations together in a peaceful way has been done by Srila Prabhupada and the Krishna consciousness movement where people from all cultures, all walks of life, all educational backgrounds, all various countries have come together to chant and dance and practice Krishna consciousness. Um, we've gone beyond all of the sectarian, what we say, uh, divisions that keep people, what we say, behind their own little fences. And that's all been broken down by Krishna consciousness. But Bhakti Tirtha Swami used to preach that a lot. That was one of his main um, uh, topics to preach to the sectarian world. How come and see our movement. And you'll see people from all walks of life, uh, all doing the same thing, worshipping the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Dham through the process of Harinam Sankirtan. So Bhakti Tirtha's life was really an amazing story 
of foresight and dynamicism with great insight on how to uh, bring Krishna consciousness to different people. At one point, he started to preach about this idea of servant leader. Uh, he said that a leader is still a servant, no matter what position they have. And uh, he wrote two books on leadership and spoke a lot about that in his lectures, so much so that it, even, it was even recognized in the secular world by Stephen Covey, who uh, one of his, the person who writes his uh, introduction, did the introduction for Bhakti Tirtha Swami's book, um, Leadership Number Two. And so uh, uh, Bhakti Tirtha Swami was really instrumental in bringing this idea that everyone is a servant no matter what position you may hold. I recall in December, I think it was December, not December, I'm sorry, October 16th, 2005, which was about a few months after Bhakti Tirti Swami left the planet, we had a, uh, a re, what we say, a memorial ceremony for him in, in Detroit at the temple. And uh, devotees came from everywhere. And people in the secular world who knew Bhakti Tirti Swami were also invited. And one senator, or actually one congressman, I think, he was, he was a senator from one state in America. And he came, and um, he wanted to speak. So he, we gave him the microphone, and he also spoke. And his whole speech was really more like how he wasn't able to fully understand, but now he found how amazing it was that when he read about Bhakti Tirta's idea that a leader is a servant, it really dawned on him that, yeah, this is really what it means to be a leader. It means to be a good servant. It means to be the best of all servants. And he said, and it goes, I can even remember parts of his speech as I was there. He was saying, this was really what we revolutionary. I was always thinking you have your leaders and you have your followers. So he never thought you could label a leader uh, a servant of the followers, but this is what when he heard about this, it really caught his attention and made him think about his position as, as a leader in society. So Bhakti Tirtha Swami impacted a lot of important people. He got on a lot of important radio shows, uh, met so many different people. Um, one thing he never liked was computers. <laughs> we'll speak about another side of Bhakti Tirtha Swami. Although he used the computer, but how did he use it? He had his secretaries read whatever emails came in. He would never read from the computer. And then he would have his secretary uh, type out all the emails. He would never read on the computer. And they would type out or, all the emails from the computer, download them, and then read it to him. And then he would read the response back or he would give a response back and they would retype it. And I remember sometimes I would come to Gita Nagar and he'd be working throughout the day. And then when it came to the evening, he would begin his emails. And sometimes he had 150, 200 emails all packed up. And so he would be up all night, the whole night, along with his secretary, just hearing the emails read and giving the responses. The next morning I would see him, I would come he said, uh, I have to chant my rounds, so you go give class. I said, fine, I'll give class, Maharaj. He wasn't sleeping. He, When he would finish his emails, he'd begin his japa. So he was very, he never liked to uh, to uh, read emails on the computer. And uh, he, he wasn't a computer person at all. But he did everything through his secretaries in that way. And... Uh, yeah, when uh, when he would, he was very serious about chanting his rounds. He never neglected his rounds. And when you were with him in the temple, he would sit right in front of Srila Prabhupada, right in front of Prabhupada's lotus feet, in a lotus position, and he would sit there chanting his 16 rounds. 
and then he would get up and go on with his service. He was very strict in his sadhana, uh, like that, and he was always eager to inspire devotees, like that. We have hundreds of stories uh, every year in um, Mayapur, during his appearance day, he was born on February 25th, around that same time. We do a program in honor of, and devotees from all over the Mayapur area, different devotees who were, knew him, people who were affected by his life, and others would come. We would always have a huge gathering, and we would be sitting there the whole day, you know, at least all morning, speaking about his glories, and then in the, in the evening, again, there would be another session. So Maharaj was really quite dynamic, but what, what, what everybody loved about him was his compassion. He generally cared for each and every person. And that was amazing. Of course, some of his secretaries who worked close with him found it hard to keep up with him because Although he, he pushed himself very hard, sometimes he pushed those who were working under him to also to do more and more services. So, of course, but he was always concerned that the devotees got everything they needed to practice Krishna consciousness. Um, his favorite foods were pizza and ice cream. So, just in case you... I remember I was in, in uh, Chicago Temple he had um, he was out preaching the whole day in chicago he came so we had uh, prashadam ready we had indian indian cuisine so he took a, a complete meal and then everything was, it was over someone else came in and said maraj we got pizza and ice cream for you he said there's always room for pizza and ice cream <laughs> so <laughs> that's just a little antidote how Maharaj was, although he was so dynamic in his Krishna consciousness, he was also very much on the personal level. He would, can relate to devotees in different ways. He was there for everybody. <laughs> he always had time for devotees. And I saw that personally because when I would go to see him in Gita Nagari, if there was some more, if, they, if there was a morning class to give, and devotees were lined up to wait to, to meet him. He would give me the morning class and say, you give the class. I need to meet with these devotees. I need to work out different situations with the community like that. So he was, uh, uh, he was tireless. And he used, I used to say to him, how do you do it, Maharaj? He said, I want to give every ounce of energy I can to Prabhupada's movement before I leave this body. And um, so he also taught that, yeah, one of the things we should understand as devotees is that whatever we're holding back in our Krishna consciousness, we should consider thinking, what is that that I'm holding back, that I'm not giving to Krishna, that I'm somehow or other refusing to surrender or keeping some material attachments for whatever reason. So he was always very much what we say, um, sh uh, shining the spotlight on everyone to look inside yourself and see what you need to advance. And of course, he made that famous statement. He made it to the entire GBC body during the Mayapur uh, festival, Gorpurnim festival. He said, and this was later on written down and circulated, we should ask, we should make this vow, we should all do this. And he asked everyone to make this vow in front of the deities. And the vow was, my dear Lord, whatever, whatever is holding me back in Krishna consciousness, please take that away. And my dear Lord, whatever I need to progress in Krishna consciousness, please bring that on. That's a paraphrase from the exact statement. But that's the essence of what he was teaching. That he always wanted everyone, uh, us, to surrender more and more and more until we became actually purely 
free from all of our personal motivations. And then he knew, because he could understand that the more we are free from our own personal motivations, the more we have the uh, shakti, the power to inf influence others and spread Krishna consciousness around the world. So that was uh, Maharaja's thing, always helping us to go deeper, become introspective, see what are our anarthas, you know, get rid of them and move on and in a real business of rendering more and more devotional service to the Lord. So there's a Maharaj's life is quite, you know, uh, dynamic. Um, it's amazing. You know, I can speak on one personal level that so many of my God brothers and others since I've been in Krishna consciousness, who I was, I met and was close to, have left the world. But no one made such an influence in me in my life than Bhakti Tirtha Swami, while he was here. In the sense that, when he left, uh, it was like the greatest loss we could also all figure. We felt that, I mean, the whole movement felt that they lost something. The GBC made a proclamation of dedication and appreciation for Bhakti Tirtha Swami. The entire GBC body got together and wrote up 35 different statements glorifying Srila Bhakti Tirtha Swami's contribution to Krishna consciousness around the world. It was a wonderful glorification. And so he was very much uh, what we say influential in spreading Krishna consciousness around the world. But <clears throat> there are many devotees who are like that, but one of the outstanding and most amazing quality is that he was always there if you needed him. He always had time for the little guy. <laughs> he would deal with people who were suicidal, who were emotionally distraught, who had so many problems on whatever level the problems were. You know, he never, you know, said, well, you go see this person, he can help you. Or, and sometime, one time I remember, I said, Maharaj, I see you, you know, you meet so many people and I see how much you're helping so many people. I said, what do you tell them? <laughs> I was a little, you know, I was a little, what we say, uh, confounded on how he helped so many people. So I guess, and he, what he said, you know, he said, a lot of times I don't say anything. I'm just there and I listen. And he said, that's what they need. They just need someone to talk to and someone who can actually really care to hear for, hear about them and try to, you know, just be there for them. So I was thinking, yeah, that's, that was Bhakti Tirtha Swami. He had always time for everybody who came and wanted to, you know, address some situation or some problem. And the GBC also also used him as a troubleshooter in helping uh, put out forest fires around ISKCON when things were getting hot in certain areas. So he was sent into different areas to, to help, uh, you know, bring about, you know, a uh, more stable situation. So his life is is really interesting. His early life is just as interesting as his Krishna conscious life and like that. Um, he was really amazing to be with. <laughs> I think you know, and uh, he had he had this shakti that was so powerful. And that it was amazing, and I can say this, and, and and other people can vouch for me. Wherever he was, all the energy in that in that room would gravitate towards him. And no matter who was in, who else was in the room, he would just pull that energy towards him. He was like he had such shakti that you just wanted to be with him. You wanted to hear from him. You wanted to just you know, associate with him. He just, 
he had that Shakti. It was really, really, really quite powerful. <laughs> and so he was very austere, very devoted, and mostly, mostly very compassionate. And he risked his life so many times to spread Krishna consciousness. Uh, and therefore, and Prabhupada gave him special, special attention and special mercy like that. So these are some of the things we can speak about in Bhakti Tirtha's life. I've just, I just skimmed the surface. I've have, I have so many more stories we can tell in relationship to all his qualities. But I think we, should, we can stop now and see if there's anyone would like to uh, ask any questions in relationship to anything I said about Bhakti Tirtha Swami or anything in relationship to the 26 qualities which we mentioned at the very beginning of the talk. We can, we can see. Hare Krishna. first one is to treat everyone you encounter as if the success of your spiritual life depends upon the quality of your interaction with them. Number one. Number two, reflect upon the person you love the most and aspire to treat everyone with that same quality of love. Number three, view all conflict as your own fault first. See conflict as a chance of growth, to clarify perceptions, and to create synergy. Number four is realize that people in your present environment might very well be the people with whom you live out your life and who will be with you at the time level. So these are, are really powerful and um, they really uh, they really show the spirit of the They're a mixture, not a mixture, but they're, they're the spiritual principles that can be applied even if they're not. Because everybody can apply these uh, principles in their life, and if you find them in a, in, you know, a Krishna conscious manner, they will help you with all aspects of your relationships with your life, and it's just such a simple thing. You'll, you'll see these kind of things given by uh, life coaches and uh, kind of secular teachers, 
and Becky Dickmer has also made a lot of good books written by Sacred Magic sources, like Stephen Covey and these other speakers, uh, and presented presented Christian consciousness sometimes in that way, you know, track, uh, everything to make it simple, and even to the point where there were cases when some of our brothers were going to actually pay to go to seminars to some of the speakers. And uh, Dr. Peter Maharaj chastised them, saying, you know, I've already read all these books, so you didn't have to do that. And if you listen to what I'm saying, you don't have to go and hear from all the other people. Um, so the, I just wanted to bring those because uh, I find these are things that we try to reflect on a lot and apply to our lives. Um, I, I personally find them all very powerful, but the one that, the, one, the middle two are ones that are most, I find most going back to, which is, uh, Reflect upon the person you love the most and aspire to treat everyone with that same kind of good love. So, this is one thing that I saw from my particular marriage. It's not that we blindly, um, you know, we imagine, for instance, the person you love the most is a child. Depending on how the child behaves, you might treat them in a different way. Um, but it's always with love. So, whether it's chastisement, whether it's encouragement, whether it's praise, it's always from a basis of love. I saw this, for instance. I was with Dr. Dibramash. Um, I was his secretary for a few short periods uh, in 2004 um, and 2003. And I was in Gita in 2004. And there was uh, just an interaction that stuck with me. There was one devotee there, a young devotee who had come from, I think, North Carolina for some training. And he kind of had a quite a um, abrasive personality. Uh, and it's kind of one of these people that's a little bit hard to be around <laughs> a lot. But he was being encouraged a lot by the devotees and everybody to kind of help him. And then to the point where um, Maharaj was going to Washington for a few days. So we all, a few of us went with him to Washington and invited this devotee to come. Uh, but the devotees still had the same kind of negative attitude to the point where he just left the library, went somewhere else, and I noticed the way the public people might go with that is he just didn't. He didn't go out of his way to, to stop that devotee from going. Whereas in other cases he would he would put a lot more energy, and I could see how he would he really was uh, discerning in how he behaved. It's not that it's a blind thing, everybody had the same treatment. I saw other cases where devotees, there was one I saw this a lot when he would do his writing, devotees would uh, write questions and had so many question, he would get at least 50 emails a day and an opportunity to hundreds a day. And he would, he would he would respond to every single one every day. I don't think the most you would wait for a response would be maybe two days uh, for a response from him. So most of the time would be very short responses. Uh, for some, from what I could see with some very special devotees, they would, they would get much longer response. And sometimes it would be the case and where it would be somebody who would has never met him before, they've maybe read a book or come into contact um, through another devotee. And, might, and there was one case where this devotee, uh, Dr. Tony, he uh, wrote to Maharaj saying, I'm coming to Gita and you know, I, I, I've read your book and I would love to meet you. So I was staying with Maharaj in Gita Nagari, and in Gita Nagari he had a house which was maybe half a mile away from the temple. Um, and during the festival time, that house was where the the devotees and most of the sannyasis would stay there. So you would have about maybe five or six sannyasis and Mara and each other. And for this trip, this bike would be written. That's different because normally that's not what would happen with guests, especially when he'd never met them before. But he invited this devotee to come and stay. And then I remember when he, that devotee arrived, we brought him to him where he was staying, and he was just shocked. He was like, and he was very nice now. And then he had to prepare a bed for him, and then I uh, did that. Um, he stayed there, and then after like midday, I was just asking him, so was the first time woman I was asking him, yeah, I it. And I was quite young and um, not as considerate. <laughs> and I said, I don't know, I think so, I'm not sure, I guess he does. And then he chastised me and told me that I could be much more considerate and better host the devotees that come to stay. Uh, and then uh, I told him that later. And this devotee, he was just so like taken in by that um, care 
and later that devotee actually took initiation with the idea from Maharaj in Kitanagari. He married another god sister and uh, lived in Kitanagari for many years. And, uh, come on, Krishna, uh, yeah, it was just amazing to see that in, in one case, those devotees who was there but there wasn't really a vision that the devotee had become Maharaj did, didn't go out of his way to kind of make him stay. And in another case, you had someone who was just super appreciative and wasn't going out of his way to kind of push himself on other people from Maharaj and keep them up and, and, and took them there. And, uh, and that was one thing that really um, struck me was uh, Maharaj's um, attention to detail in Krishna consciousness. There was a few very brief exchanges that also stuck with me. Um, I, at one point I went through and watched all the Prabhupada videos from the archives and I remember there's one video of Prabhupada uh, he's in the car, and it's just a video of Prabhupada sitting in the back of the car. And the car stops, and the devotee opens the door. And Prabhupada doesn't waste even one second to get out of the door. And he's sort of told he's out, there's no messing around. And I saw that a lot with with Prabhupada. I should be doing it like, I don't know, and then he just at all. He needed to go somewhere, because there was a good library. Prabhu, we are not able to hear you, I think. Sandhya Prabhu, are you still there? Yeah, the volume is quite low. Yeah, I think we've lost Prabhu Hare Krishna Prabhu, are you there? Because we lost you in between. Nanda's still there, but I heard yeah. practically everything he said, but it was a very, very low volume. So if the volume can be increased, that would be the, that would help. Mm -hmm.
stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nanda Hare Krishna. That was wonderful. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. It was really wonderful. I think for Bhakti Dev Maharaj, I think the biggest message I am at least taking this evening is his love for the devotees and for everyone around him. And uh, but I'm sure there's lots of other messages. I think we can, uh, Maharaj, we have a couple of things now. We can, we have obviously devotees who would be, who would like to ask some questions, but we also have a small video on uh, Bhakti Dev Maharaj, which is like less than four minutes long. So uh, I would just like to ask your permission. What would be like, what should we do first? Should we take the questions or should we take the video? Because I'm just conscious that some of the devotees that are very new, they would not have even seen Bhakti Dev Maharaj. So through this video, they can hear him and see him. So, okay, we can go ahead with the video. <laughs> and um, yes. will it be visible for everybody? I mean, I, I would suggest devotees, you know, once I share and I pick the video, please type in yes on the chat box so I know that you can hear and see the video. Yeah? So I will share it now. We need the audio. Mm -hmm. 